In this video, I'll be showing you how to make the collars for the movie era engineering radiation suits. We'll be covering both the black collars worn in the motion picture and by officers and enlisted crew in the Wrath of Khan, as well as the red trainee versions. This is the first in a four-part series in which I'll be walking you through each element of the entire costume ensemble. I'm also posting the entire costume tutorial on my blog, www.startrekcostumeguide.com, where you can read through everything in detail. It'll also be available as a free PDF download once I've completed the series. This tutorial walkthrough is intended for use with my Taylor's Gone Wild sewing patterns, which are available at www.taylorsgonewild.com. For these, I had the privilege of studying and patterning directly off a screen-used engineering radiation suit, thanks to Raymond Arsic. And if you enjoy this free tutorial, please support my costume research on coffee. This helps me be able to produce more sewing and costuming resources like this. So let's dive in. For the black motion picture and Wrath of Khan officer slash enlisted collars, you'll need a sheet or roll of quarter inch or six millimeter black neoprene. I just got mine on eBay. As of the making of this tutorial, there are a lot of sellers and options. These sheets are usually predetermined sizes, so be sure to choose one wide enough and long enough for your collar, plus several inches for the strips. I used an extra large neoprene sheet which was 17 inches wide and 72 inches long, but I was making multiple collars for patterning and demonstration purposes. This one sheet yielded five full collars, so unless you're costuming a cast for a fan film or something, you'll probably be fine with a smaller sheet. Alternatively, you could use craft or EVA foam to make the collar. Neoprene's not that expensive, but craft foam is probably cheaper. Just as an experiment to see what would happen, I made a collar out of foam as opposed to the neoprene. I found that the foam works fine for a static costume display, but if you're planning to actually wear the costume, I definitely recommend going with the neoprene. You can see the neoprene is already fairly stiff, but it bends into place well enough without really putting up much of a fuss. The foam is way less flexible though. You can still twist it into shape, but there's a lot of tension when you do, and it's always trying to pull back open so it's flat again. The neoprene collars are already kind of uncomfortable to wear, but the foam collars are almost like wearing wood. So it's an option if you're on a shoestring budget, but I strongly suggest going with the neoprene. But since the collar is an entirely separate component of the costume, you can always upgrade or replace it later. Unlike most fabrics, neoprene has no directional grain, so you can orient your collar pattern on the neoprene however you like to get the most out of your sheet. If you're planning to make multiple collars, and I do suggest making one for practice, interlocking your collar pattern pieces is a way to make efficient use of your neoprene sheet. For these non-trainee versions of the collar, there are no seam or hem allowances. The raw edges of the neoprene won't fray, and the neckline piping is the only sewing involved. However, this does mean that the neoprene needs to be cleanly cut. I found the best way to achieve a smooth cut on the neoprene was to trace the collar pattern with a metallic silver sharpie, then slowly cut inside the traced outline with a sharp X-Acto knife over a cutting mat. You'll also need a bunch of quarter inch wide neoprene strips. These can be cut in any direction, and you can use the larger scraps from where you cut around your collar too. For the most consistent and even results, I recommend cutting them using a rotary cutter along a clear ruler over a cutting mat. There doesn't seem to have been much rhyme or reason to the concentration or positioning of the quarter inch strips along the collar, except that the ends were generally closer together along the neckline and flared outward a bit toward the lower edge. On the side front, I do suggest placing the outermost strip just inside the edge of the opening. And on the side back, I suggest placing the outermost strip so it just barely overhangs the opening. That way it'll help cover the seam once the collar's closed. Otherwise, position them however looks best to you and carefully apply a thin strand of glue along the underside of each strip, one by one. I used E6000 glue and was really happy with the results. I tried tacky glue at first and wasn't impressed with it. It was messy to work with, took longer to dry, and they said it dried clear, but I'm calling BS on that. 
I'm sure I'm invisible. I suggest practicing with a few spare strips and attaching them to some neoprene scraps to get a feel for how much glue to safely use. It doesn't take much. And don't mash the strips very hard onto the collar because you don't want to make the glue ooze out from underneath. I also suggest cutting your strips so they're slightly longer than the collar itself and extend beyond the lower edge. Once the glue is dry, trim the quarter inch strips even with the lower edge of the collar. Cut a 3.5 inch length of 7 8 inch black grosgrain ribbon and 1 inch black hook and loop tape, also known as Velcro. Apply some liquid fray preventer to the ends of the ribbon. Once the liquid fray preventer is dry, overlap the ribbon and the hook or scratchy side of the tape along the long ends and secure the two together with a zigzag stitch. This combined assembly forms the back underlap of the collar closure. Position the assembly onto the underside of the collar so the velcro extends forward beyond the rear side edge. And trim the lower edge of the ribbon if you need to so it doesn't poke out from underneath the lower edge of the collar. Then glue the ribbon to the underside of the collar. Again, I used tacky glue at first for a while before switching to the E6000 and I definitely recommend using that instead. Although that's how the back of the screen used collar I examined was made, another option would be to machine sew the velcro to a 2 inch or wider length of grosgrain ribbon. That way you don't have to do the overlapping zigzag stitch thing. Then you glue the velcro underlap assembly to the underside of the collar just like I showed you for the previous method. Either way, position the corresponding loop tape onto the underside of the collar front side edge, again trimming the lower corner if you need to, and glue it into place. Once those are dry, cut a thin quarter inch wide strip of black hook and loop tape, again three and a half inches long. Place the opposite lengths along the vertical edges of the collar opening and glue them into place. In other words, place the hook or scratchy tape along the front vertical edge and place the loop or fuzzy tape along the back vertical edge. You can use sticky back velcro for this, but in my experience they don't stay attached for very long. It's better to glue these into place with the E6000. Cut another 3.5 inch length of your black velcro and cut the lower edge so it's slightly pointed. Then glue the hook or scratchy side to the underside of the collar at the center front. This is to fasten the collar to the corresponding loop or fuzzy side of the velcro on the upper front of the jumpsuit. For the motion picture collar, you're all finished. For the Wrath of Khan era officer and enlisted collar, there are a few more steps. Cut a length of one half inch upholstery cord long enough to wrap around the outer neckline of the collar. I suggest taping the ends of your cord over the area where you'll be cutting to prevent it from unraveling. Cut your collar's neckline piping channel out of some black lightweight spandex. Wrap the spandex around your half inch upholstery cord and pin it snugly into place. I find it helpful to also pin the two layers of the lip together. Using your zipper slash piping foot and black thread, stitch the spandex layers together close to the edge of the cord. I also like to stitch the piping channel closed along the ends of the cord. I saw no evidence of this on the screen used collar I examined, but I suggest switching to your all purpose sewing foot and stitching again a quarter inch away from the edge of the cord.
trim the ends of the spandex down to about an inch beyond the ends of the piping, and trim one of the lip allowances away close to the second row of stitching. Turn the ends of the piping allowance under, angling them downward slightly to hide them, and machine stitch them into place outside the cord. Trim the ends of the allowance so they're flush with the lip and hand sew the upper edges of the allowance to the underside of the piping. Carefully apply some E6000 glue along the vertical edge of the collar neckline and the inner lip of the neckline piping close to the cord and attach the neckline piping to the collar. The edge of the cord should be pulled snugly against the upper surface of the strips on the outside of the collar, hiding the raw ends of the strips at the neckline. Because the neckline piping is slightly longer than the edge of the neckline itself, ease in the piping as best you can. There may be a few wrinkles, but they won't be seen on the outside of the finished collar. Since you probably have no more than two hands to work with, but the entire neckline needs to be firmly mashed together for several minutes while the glue sets, I suggest doing the outermost few inches of each end first, then doing a little bit at a time until you've done the entire neckline. Once the glue is dry, turn the piping lip to the underside, trim away the lip over the front velcro overlap, and glue the lip fabric into place. I'll again mention that the E6000 glue is cleaner to work with and dries faster than other glues I tried. Here's the underside of a collar I made with E6000, and here's the underside of one I made with tacky glue. That one made a big mess and forced me to clip additional allowance into the piping lip. It ultimately doesn't really matter what the underside looks like since it'll never be seen on the finished costume, but I just want to emphasize that the E6000 glue is by far the best option I'm aware of at the moment. The neckline piping closures were a pair of modified clear plastic mirror mounts. The screen used mounts had a subtle rectangular pyramid shape along the extension, but the ones I used were a slightly different design. I use them solely out of convenience, and such a subtle detail is unlikely to ever be noticed on the finished costume. You'll need to drill a small hole into the extension on each mount, where we'll be inserting a small wooden dowel. Centered or slightly outward from center is best. To prevent the plastic from shattering, you may want to make an initial pilot hole using a pin vise. I also suggest firmly bracing the plastic mount with pliers, starting with thinner drill bits and working your way up to the final size. I wound up using a 9 64th inch drill bit to accommodate the 1 8th inch wooden dowel. The dowel itself is just a common dowel like you might find at a craft store or hardware store. They usually come in 24 inch or 36 inch lengths, which is way more than we actually need. We only need about 3 eighths of an inch for this. That's a lot of leftover, but oh well. Anyway, with both holes drilled, confirm your two pieces will actually fasten together by inserting your dowel through both at the same time like they will be on the finished collar. Cut a length of the wooden dowel long enough to extend from the bottom of one mount to the top of the other, again probably about 3 eighths of an inch long. Paint the small rod whatever color you have that best matches your clear plastic piece. I used top notch metallic pearl. Glue the wooden rod into the hole you drilled on one of the mirror mounts. As best I can tell, the small accents on the original closures were screw back dome rivets, a specific kind of upholstery rivet that fastens with a screw on the back. They might have actually been double cap dome rivets, but I wasn't able to find any in the appropriate size, and the screw back dome rivets work fine. The screen used rivets were approximately 3 eighths of an inch, or 10 millimeters in diameter, and a sort of matte nickel color. I've included a link to the ones I used on my blog. There are two caveats we need to deal with, though. First, they're a shiny silver color, as opposed to the matte nickel, but you can paint them if you want. I didn't bother painting mine, and think they look okay in person, but obviously that's up to you. Second, it seems that for some reason, with these, the length of the included screw is nearly always the same as the diameter of the rivet. 
In other words, a 3 8 inch or 10 millimeter rivet usually comes with a 3 8 inch or 10 millimeter screw. Not very useful for our purposes. Since we need the screw to extend through half an inch of neckline piping and a 3 8 inch tall mirror mount, we obviously need longer screws that also fit the rivets. And since there's nothing to stop the screws from pulling straight through the collar piping, we need to brace the head of the screw on the underside of the collar piping with a washer. Here's the exact combination of pieces I used on my collars. Unfortunately, the 1 inch screws are a bit too long, 3 quarter inch screws are a bit too short, and my store didn't have 7 8 inch screws of the appropriate width and thread count. But on the bright side, the screws I used also came with small nuts, which can be used to fill the extra distance between the head of the screw and the edge of the neckline piping. Thread one of the nuts all the way onto the screw, then slide one of the washers all the way to the nut. Your screw assembly should look like this. Using your seam ripper, poke a hole all the way through your neckline piping close to the side opening. Insert small, sharp fabric scissors and just slash around until you've made a hole through the spandex and cord big enough for the screw. Slide the screw assembly through the hole from the underside. With the screw poking out of the hole, lower the mirror mount onto it, with the screw going through the factory made screw hole, where you would normally screw it into the wall. The male mount with the painted wooden rod goes on the back of the collar, and the female mount with the corresponding hole goes on the front. Place the rivet over the factory made hole in the mirror mount and tighten it onto the screw. Then do the same for the other side. Behind the plastic closures, hand sew a small black snap onto the ends of the neckline piping. Cut a small rectangle of black felt, about 1 inch by 2 inches, and slightly round one corner. Double check to make sure your screws are fully tightened, then position the felt onto the rear underside of the collar opening so it covers the screw assembly. The front edge is flush with the velcro, and the velcro slightly overlaps the lower edge of the felt. Hand sew the felt to the underside of the neckline piping, lip, ribbon, and velcro. Your collar is now finished. I'm not sure exactly what fabric the screen used trainee collars were made with, only that it was a knit fabric instead of neoprene. I suggest using a heavy matte knit fabric. For this demonstration collar, I used a cotton knit fabric and custom dyed it orangey flame red. Since cotton is a cellulose fiber, it responded well to fiber reactive dye. Not as well as rayon might have, but it took it. In my experience, cotton knits absorb a lot of fiber reactive dye with the proper leveling and bonding agents, but multiple scours afterward bleed a lot of it right back off the fabric. Anyway, I didn't have a screen used trainee collar to color match, so there's some room for subjective interpretation here regarding the ideal target color. In The Wrath of Khan, these collars look deep red, but in the other movies they look more orange. Of course, the same was true for other trainee-specific garments and elements. I do love the look and visual style of The Wrath of Khan, but as of the making of this tutorial, I think the other movies were probably closer to the actual fabric colors. And while I usually think auction photos are almost useless for color reference, the trainee collars did consistently appear to be an orangey flame red. 
I only mention this to emphasize that the following dye recipe is my interpretation of the trainee collar color based on these visual references, not color matched to a screen use costume element. That said, on the cotton knit fabric I mentioned earlier, I used the following dye recipe. 60% deep yellow and 40% light red, both of which are primary single pigment fiber reactive dyes from Dharma Trading Company. The component colors and custom mix are both standard 1% stock solutions, applied at an 8% depth of shade on the cotton knit fabric. If you have no idea what this means but are interested in learning, I'm planning to produce a Taylor's Gone Wild fabric dyeing course after my sewing and tailoring courses are finished. If that's something you're interested in, then drop by www.taylorsgonewild.com and subscribe to my Sewing Wizard newsletter. And if you prefer a different target color or you're working with a different fabric, feel free to experiment and adjust the dye recipe accordingly. I suggest stabilizing your knit fabric with a lightweight woven fusible interfacing since we'll be quilting the collar and we don't want it to stretch out of shape while we're working. I like to apply the interfacing over a large area of fabric before cutting out the collar. Although the trainee collar pattern piece on my Taylor's Gone Wild sewing patterns does include half inch seam allowance, there is some DIY involved to establish the flared quilted channels. I would have liked to include channel guides on the printed patterns, but the pattern piece would have become incoherently cluttered. So instead of creating confusion, I kept the pattern clean, and this way you can establish the quilted channels however you like. There seems to have been some variation among the screen use collars regarding the positioning and widths of the channels. As with the black neoprene collars, the only consistent thing I saw was that the channels were narrower and closer together at the neckline, then widened downward toward the outer edge of the collar. Generally speaking, I suggest drafting the top of your channels about half an inch wide and half an inch apart along the neckline, and about an inch wide and an inch apart along the outer edge of the collar, with the exceptions being the center front and center back channels, which I suggest widening to one and a quarter inches. It doesn't seem to matter how many channels there actually are, just make sure your center front and center back channels are quilted. You may need to cheat a bit on the specific dimensions to distribute the channels as evenly as possible, but I suggest trying to stay pretty close to those proportions. You can use whatever lightweight fabric you like for the backing. I just used a piece of leftover jumpsuit body fabric, but you could use a leftover piece of muslin instead. I literally drew my channel guides onto the backing fabric with a black sharpie. The screen used trainee collars look like they may have been trapunto quilted like so many other uniforms and costumes of the era, but obviously none of us is likely to have a trapunto machine at our disposal. Instead, in this case, I suggest using a combination of high loft quilt batting and thick foam interfacing to achieve a similar effect. The method I present here isn't the only way to make the collar. You may wish to adapt or modify it more to your liking. If so, go for it but here's how I made mine. You'll need two cuts of your fabric, one layer of high loft quilt batting with the seam allowances removed, and your backing fabric with the channels marked. Apply some fabric temporary spray adhesive to your high loft batting and position it onto your backing fabric. Carefully trim the batting out of every other channel. Apply some of the temporary spray adhesive to the underside of your collar fabric, then position it on top of the batting slash backing assembly so the batting is sandwiched between the collar and backing layers. Using matching red thread, stitch along the marked lines from the underside. If you used a sharpie like I did, the lines should be visible through the backing fabric. Extend a few stitches into the seam allowances on both ends and backstitch a few times. Guterman Thread Color 405 is a good color match for the dye mix I mentioned. Ordinarily I'd recommend using an even feed walking foot for quilting, but in this case we're only quilting every other channel, so I suggest using a zipper slash piping foot to stitch along the marker lines against the edge of the batting. Your collar may contract a bit from all the quilting. Compare it against your pattern piece and stretch it back out if you need to. Cut a three and a half inch length of red hook and loop tape. On the collar facing, position the loop or fuzzy side just inside the seam allowances on the edge of the side front opening. Machine stitch the tape into place and set the hook or scratchy side of the tape aside for now. 
Sew the collar facing to the quilted collar assembly along the side and outer edges with half inch seam allowance right sides together. Trim the side and outer seam allowances down to an eighth of an inch. Turn the collar assembly right sides out and press the edges flat. I suggest only pressing the lower edges of the unquilted channels to avoid flattening the batting inside the quilted ones. The quilted channels looked okay, but I was dissatisfied with the poofiness of even the high loft batting afterward, at least in comparison to the screen used collars. I bolstered up the quilted channels afterward with some thick foam interfacing underneath. Cut some flared strips of the foam slightly smaller than the quilted channels on your collar and with no seam allowances. Insert them into the collar underneath the quilted channels, beneath the quilted assembly and facing layers, and pin them into place along the stitch lines. From the outside of the collar, stitch again along the previous stitch lines to secure the foam. Here you can see these channels have just the high loft batting and they look okay, but over here these ones have the foam too, and you can see they're much closer to the look of the screen used collars. This process is effective and I'm much happier with the finished result, but it's admittedly a hassle. There may be an easier way. You may want to experiment with multiple layers of high loft batting, consolidating this process, or a faux trapunto quilting technique instead. Anyway, now that the collar is quilted, cut a 3.5 inch length of red grosgrain ribbon and apply some liquid fray preventer to the ends. Once it's dry, slightly overlap the ribbon and hook or scratchy side of the velcro along the long ends and secure the two with a zigzag stitch like I showed you earlier for the black collar. Position this assembly onto the underside of the collar so the velcro extends past the side edge, and trim the ends of the ribbon if you need to so it doesn't extend into the neckline seam or past the bottom of the collar. You can glue the ribbon to the underside of the collar using the E6000 glue, you can hand sew it, or both. Personally, I suggest doing both. The neckline piping construction is basically the same as I already showed you earlier for the black collar. The main differences are that in this case the piping is made with the same flame red knit fabric as the collar itself, and the piping is sewn onto the collar rather than glued. So prepare the neckline piping just like I showed you for the black collar. Pin the piping to the collar along the neckline with the piping ends flush with the side edges. Then sew the piping to the collar using a zipper slash piping foot and with half inch seam allowance. Turn the neckline allowance under and trim away a bit of the front allowance over the velcro. Hand sew the allowance to the underside of the collar. Cut another 3.5 inch length of your red velcro and cut the lower edge so it's slightly pointed. Hand sew this length of hook tape to the underside of the collar at the center front. Make and attach the neckline closures, accents, and snaps the same way I already showed you for the black collar. Then attach a small rectangle of closely matching red felt to the back of the closure. Without having examined a screen used trainee collar, I'm not sure exactly how the original tubing assemblies on the front were made. However, the way I'm about to show you will produce a convincing facsimile. For this, you'll need some quarter inch clear tubing, four tubing end caps, and a quarter inch rectangular wooden dowel. You want to make sure your end caps fit your tubing. Like the round dowels, you can probably find a rectangular one in the craftwood section of your local crafts or hardware store. Paint the four end caps the metallic color of your choice. I used folk art metallic gunmetal gray. Cut two 7 8 inch lengths of your rectangular wooden dowel, lightly sand them, and paint them with the same metallic paint you used for the tubing caps. Cut two lengths of your clear tubing, long enough to extend from just below the neckline piping to about three-eighths of an inch above the lower edges, on the two unquilted channels next to the center. Place the end caps on both ends of the tubing, then repeat for the other length of tubing.
Position the tubing onto the collar so the upper edges just barely touch the neckline piping. To secure the tubing assemblies to the collar, you can use a small amount of clear E6000 glue. Hand sew the tubes to the collar at the edges of the caps with dark gray thread, or both. I suggest both. Apply a small dab of clear E6000 glue to the outer bottom area of the lower cap and a thin strip of glue to one side of the rectangular dowel. Glue the dowel into place on the collar, angled slightly to be parallel, or nearly parallel to the lower edge, and directly touching the bottom of the end cap so the two will bond together. Repeat for the other side. Your trainee collar is now finished. Just a reminder that this entire costume tutorial is available on my blog, www.startrekcostumeguide.com, and it'll also be available as a free PDF download once I've finished this four-part series. If you enjoyed this tutorial, if you found it interesting or helpful and would like to see more like it, please support my costume research on Coffee. This helps me be able to produce more sewing and costuming resources like this. And if you're wanting to learn how to sew, I'm putting together a series of sewing and tailoring courses which will be available soon. You can check those out at www.taylorsgonewild.com. Men's and women's sewing patterns for this costume are available there too. Anyway, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already, and if you're able, I'd greatly appreciate your support on Coffee. See you again soon in part two.